¿Podemos comenzar? Sí, sí, adelante, René. Vamos. Voy a comenzar a grabar. Good morning, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Welcome again for this uh, new seminar. Today, sorry, is a colloquium. And uh, today we will have the talk by Dr. Mariana Sanchez. And uh, she will talk about formation, evolution, and detection of uh, rocky planets around very low mass stars and brown dwarf. So uh, Dr. Mariana Sanchez will be introduced by uh, Isabel Marquez. Please, Isabel. Thank you, Good morning, everybody here online. Thank you for following this new Severo uh, Colloquium. Today we have the pleasure to have uh, with us uh, Dr. Mariana Sanchez. Thank you very much, Mariana, for having accepted our invitation. Our uh, today's speaker, Mariana Sanchez, is a postdoctoral researcher in the Planet Formation Group at Leiden University. Uh, last year, only last year, uh, she obtained her PhD title Formation, Evolution and Detection of Rocky Planets at the Substellar Mass Limit at the uh, Universidad Nacional de La Plata in, in Argentina. Uh, since the bachelor's uh, thesis project, he has been focusing on studying planet formation and dynamical evolution. In the last few years, she has focused her studies on understanding rocky, rocky uh, planet formation and evolution around very low mass, uh, uh, mass objects through n-body um, simulations and estimating the detection probability for characterization by transit, radio velocity, and astrometric techniques. She has also gained observation experience in dealing with ALMA, ALMA data of pre and proto brown dwarf candidates during her interview trip at the European uh, Southern Observatory in, in Chile. Her main work is hence linking protoplanetary disks and exoplanet population characterization around very low mass stars to different planet formation scenarios. And as you know, today she's speaking about theoretical models uh, of the formation and evolution of ultra cool, cool dwarf planetary systems. Thank you very much, uh, Mariana, and the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, good morning, everybody. Thanks to all of you who could join either in person or online. And thanks to the organization of this uh, Severo Choa colloquium program and Professor Pedro Amado to give me this space and inviting me to give this talk in the, in the Institute. So as um, Isabel said, I'm um, re um, recently uh, start my postdoc at the Leiden Observatory. I'm working with uh, Professor Ninja van der Mark. And today I will give a brief uh, review about what we know of, uh, of planet formation around very long stars and brown dwarf. And then I will focus uh, mostly in the research I have developed during my PhD, uh, with under the uh, supervi supervision of um, Professor Gonzalo de Villa in Argentina and Van Damme in, in Uruguay. So let's dive in. Here, just uh, to present the objects we, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about. So uh, I will focus on Loma stars and brown dwarf that today we know like, that um, it, both very low mass stars uh, through the uh, substellar domain, they present both protoplanetary disks and they have confirmed either giant planet down to the Earth sized planet. So, to present these objects, uh, I would say that very low mass stars are objects with a mass between around 0 0.08 and 0 0.5 solar masses, and the brown dwarf domain, these uh, kind of objects that share some uh, characteristics both with the stars and with giant planets, are um, objects with masses beyond 13 Jupiter masses up to uh, 80 solar masses. So we know that these objects are hosting planets and some it's important to take into account when we study the formation around them that such objects are evolving with time especially during the first hundreds up to gigaia time scale. 
So if we focus on brown dwarf are never reaching the main sequence, but very low mass stars are reaching the main sequence, but they are taking such a long time. And if we focus on the and low mass limit, they can take up to two three years to reach the main sequence. So our study will be focused mostly in the in this pre uh, pre main sequence phase. And during this time, they are evolving uh, a lot. So they are decreasing their radius, their luminosity, their rotational period. So they are increasing their rotational velocity. And in this plot, I'm, I'm just showing you as an example how the rotational period and the radius of an object at the subcellular mass limit is evolving during time. You can see it's decreasing a lot, just uh, almost 90% of the radius is. Um, uh, is is uh, decreasing in just a hundred million in a time scale. So this is something to take into account in our models of planet formation. So as I told you, we have both evidence of protoplanetary disk and exoplanets around these uh, such low mass objects. So we believe the the whole picture of planet formation is so, so can be um, applied in this uh, low mass domain. So we believe also that planetary systems. Uh, follow this path, so the star is warming through a gravitational collapse from molecular cloud, and um, after we it reached the protostellar phase, it's gonna host a protoplanetary disk of dust and gas in the mid plane, and after a few million years of interactions between the dust and the gas component, we are gonna uh, have planetary systems that we can observe today. So regarding the what we know about protoplanetary disk around Grand Dwarf, I'm just showing you here a plot um, of these uh, reviews that I, I believe is one of the last reviews made of uh, protoplanetary disk around Grand Dwarf. So in here, they took the biggest sample of uh, Brown Dwarf in different uh, star forming regions that um, have um, spectral energy distribution information and also and my data, and they they reached the conclusion that the outer radius of such a disk is going to be in most of the cases less than fifty AU, and in some in some cases even less than ten AU, and the uh, disk mass is going to be in most of the cases already at one million year, it's going to be less than one Jupiter mass. So in this plot, they are showing the total disk mass. Uh, in different star forming regions of Eucus, Taurus, Lupus, and Arbor Scorpius. And you can see that from the very beginning, most of the disk, they have like big uh, error bars because there are some outliers. But if you consider the whole sample, most of the disk um, are having masses less than one Jupiter. And this is decreasing over time, as is also expected around um, more massive objects. And if we uh, look into protoplanetary disk around the low mass stars, um, taking this uh, one of the last reviews um, made by Van der Mar and Malders in 2021, in, in, in their work, um, they also take into account more massive stars. So in this plot, they consider all the sample of stars from the substellar mass limit up to around one solar mass. Um, and also they took into account the same um, star forming regions. And you can see in this plot, the calculation of the outer radius of the dust component against the, um, the dust mass. In, in black, you can see all the disks that didn't show um, any structures or compact disks. Then in, in blue, you can see the disk that present ring structures and in red, in red the transition disk. So if we consider just the protoplanetary disk around very long mass stars, um, they found, they, they could estimate an outer uh, radius for the dust component between <coughs> 5 and 40 EU and a dust mass up to 10 Earth masses. So which means most of um, the black dots. So most of the disks uh, are found to be compact and low mass. And in this uh, diagram here, they are showing like around very low mass stars, so with masses less than 0.5 in black 
are the compact discs, so most of the discs are believed to host a low mass planet. A planet, if they host a planet, still cannot be detected for now, embedding the disk, it should be less than 0 0.2 Jupiter masses. So from the protoplanetary disk point of view, we are expecting to, um, to have low mass planets in around such low mass objects. But if we look now around the exoplanet population, around very low mass objects, I'm showing here this um, mass of the planet against the major axis of just the planets around low mass objects. So in purple or violet, you can see the planets around very low mass stars, and these green diamonds are the planets that have been detected around uh, the less massive boundaries. So the purple ones are contemplating from 0 0.07 up to 0 0.5 solar masses. So from the, um, the old sample of confirmed exoplanets, around 400 are found around very low mass stars, and close to 20 around uh, the less massive boundaries. And uh, doing a bit of a statistic uh, with um, NASA exoplanet archive data, I found that 50% of the planets uh, have masses less than 10 Earth masses in comparison with more massive stars with this kind of planet are just representing 15%. And from this 50% uh, 15, 15 of uh, the planets in the sample, 65% are found in multi-planetary systems. So what we can conclude is that the majority of the planets are around this kind of low mass objects are low mass planets and they are locating so close in to the star. And even though here there are no difference uh, in colors regarding the detection technique, I can tell you that most of them are detected with either transit or prior velocity. So here I'm sure most of you are familiar with this uh, system, but just to make a comparison, <laughs> Travis-1 system, which is a late M dwarf, is, a, is so compact and the seven planets that this star hosts, the, the orbit of the outermost planet is uh, inside the orbit of uh, Mercury in our solar system. So just to have an idea of the scale of how compact these planetary systems are comparing to our solar system. And one last concept I wanted to highlight is the concept of the habitable zone. So this area around the star where a planet can, um, can have liquid water on its surface. So just for you to see, this is how the inner and outer edge of the habitable zone is evolving with time. And to compare um, the evolution around a late end dwarf, and the evolution of the inner and outer edge of the habitable zone around a sun like a star. So this is something to take into account when we analyze a, a potential habitability around this such a low mass object. Because as you can see around a late uh, M dwarf, um, the habitable zone is uh, evolving, is closer to a star than around a sun like a star. And also it's evolving with time, changing like one or up to two orders of magnitude in a GIE at time scale. So this is something to take into account regarding the habitability. So after all this um, concept that I mentioned, this is the motivation of uh, my work. The fact that very long stars together with brown dwarf are um, the most abundant objects around the neighborhood. And just very long as stars represent close to 70% of the stars in our galaxy. And the Earth like planets that could be located in the habitable zone are so close in to the star, which makes this uh, long mass object ideal for the search of life with already ongoing technology. So now going into my research, I, I will talk about mostly. Um, about the study of rocky planets at the substellar mass limit. So we study the formation and evolution through M-body simulation. So um, we use the original version of <coughs> Mercury code and uh, we include some uh, external effects as external forces. So the M-body code, what is doing, you have in M-bodies. In our case, we propose a sample of m protoplanetary embryo. And then you are putting them as an input to the code. And the code is taking into account not just gravitational interactions between the bodies, but 
but all the external effects we added. And then we analyze the output in order to see which kind of planetary architectures we are finding. So the external forces that we add to the code are general relativistic corrections, tidal effects that in our equilibrium tidal model, we include the contraction and spin up of the star, as I showed you earlier, and we fix uh, self synchronization for the photoplanetary embryos. And in our first work, we realized that after running simulations of for 100 million years, that the tidal interactions are leading to a uh, preserve and make a closing plant population survive over time. So this is why we um, include these effects and then we add planetary interactions in order to see which kind of um, architectures we were obtaining. And in order to treat uh, the planetary disk interactions, we use a standard disk model, but we aim to taste it with two different uh, prescriptions for the gas disk store. So I will focus this talk mainly in what we published last year regarding all these uh, effects. So just to give, I, I didn't want to bore you with the formulas, but you can uh, see them in the, in the, on the paper, but just for you to know and give you some reference of um, how we develop each of them in this correction, and also to show you uh, what they are doing dynamically to the systems. So including uh, uh, relative general relativistic corrections is mostly affecting the precession of the argument of periastrum. The tidal effects are uh, also affecting not only the precession of the argument of periastrum, but similar axis and eccentricity decay mostly. And the planet disk interactions, in order to calculate them, we use this uh, non thermal uh, disk model, and we use the disk profiles uh, from a standard uh, model and in order to calculate the gas disk torques, we just took into account the Lindler and rotational torques. And we aim to study uh, which kind of acceleration corrections these planet disk interactions were provoking on the planet, following these different prescriptions, that they differ mostly in, in not only in the acceleration terms, but in the time scales of the decay of the similar axis, eccentricity, and inclination. And, and also because this uh, classical prescription is based on hydrodynamical simulations around sun like stars, so they are widely used in the literature. But we aim to see if we can also uh, apply them to the low mass domain. And this last prescription, either 2020, this prescription is uh, based purely on dynamical friction. So it can be applied for sure to any kind of stuff. So we aim to compare them to see um, how, how they differ or agree regarding the migration and orbital decay of the bodies. And in, in here, and here I'm showing you just to see why we choose these two different prescriptions. Also because when we analyze the total torque and uh, you can see in different colors from the warm ones are positive, the cold ones are negative. You can see regarding different planetary masks and the major axis, how we obtain different kind of uh, total torque. This is just a snapshot in the inner disk. So if we have an eccentricity of zero, so circular orbit and also a planet, both of the prescriptions agree and are the same in the calculation of the torque. But when we have more eccentric orbits, so as an example, 0.1, they are differing in the um, magnitude of the total torque. And this is going to impact directly in the direction of the migration and also in the whole planetary architecture. <laughs> so as, as uh, inputs, we start our simulation at one million year. We took a sample of 30 protoplanetary embryos, and we consider that in the first million years, they were ideally already formed, and they reach uh, around 1.5 the mass of Mars, we locate them beyond the um, snow line of the system with these uh, aleatory mutual separations and all of them uh, close to coplanar and, and close to circular orbits. And this is um, these are the parameters for the gastics model. So a fixed uh, viscosity parameter and opacity, we make the accretion rate and the luminosity evolves, so the, the, the gas disk is evolving 
over time. And this is the location, the inner, the inner um, edge of the disk, that is approximately three, three times the radio of the star. And we consider that this lifetime of um, 10 million years and after that time, the disk is dissipated. And then we continue our interactions. So the first result uh, and we show you during this class stage. So in here, I'm showing you a snapshot of um, all the survival uh, embryos regarding their eccentricity and the major axis. In the, the top panels represent the embryos that survive if we include the IDA20 prescription and the bottom ones in we, if we include the Crest Van Nelson prescription. So in the sorry, the color palette represents the initial semi major axis of the protoplanetary embryos. And this vertical line, the inner edge of the disk, and this black curve, the line that is telling you when the eccentricity is equal to the Hayes scale of the disk to differentiate the supersonic and the subsonic regime. So if you can see if the eccentricity is lower than the Hayes scale of the disk, there is almost no difference between the two prescriptions, but when it's higher, we can see in, in the inner edge of the disk mostly the uh, greatest difference, differences sorry, uh, between both of the techniques. So just if we include this prescription, we get a bunch of protoplanetary embryos that survive along all the uh, gases lifetime, but we have a lack of planets, closing planets that survive if we use the other prescription. So this is the main difference. And when we analyze the conditional histories, uh, also uh, what we can see, because just they are histograms of embryos that enter inside the cavity of the disk and ended up colliding with the star. And these histograms are represented embryos that um, collided among them. So if we use the classical prescription, most of the embryos enter inside the cavity, migrate so fast and call it to, with a central star. But with we, if we include the other prescription, most of the embryos start um, have collision among them and survive along all the gas disk uh, left. And in here, just with these community histograms, I'm showing you that most of these uh, kind of collisions occur during the gas disk stage. And just uh, a few of them up to Hundred million years. So after that, the system maintained dynamically stable. And when we analyze the planetary systems <laughs> after the gas dissipates, we found many planets, many pairs of planets in mean motion resonances. So in order to classificate these resonances, we are um, uh, checking that the critical uh, angle is uh, rating, and then. <coughs> Um, the both parents, both uh, planets are in commensurable orbit, so they satisfy these two criteria. And under this criterion, we have seen that many uh, planets are in mean motion resonances, but not just one pair of planets are in resonance in each system, several of them. So we found many several resonant chains. In here, I'm showing you an histogram of a total number of uh, resonances taking into account the simulations made uh, with both prescriptions. We just found more planets in, in the dynamical friction prescription because more planets survive. But in both of the cases, we found uh, different orders of resonances. And as I told you before, reson different resonance chains. So several planets were in resonance. The main difference among these prescriptions regarding uh, Resonances is mostly the, the breakup mechanism. So under this prescription, most of the planets uh, break apart, most of this resonance break apart before the gas dissipates. And uh, if you use dynamical friction, most of the planets survive, but once the gas is dissipates, most of these uh, resonances uh, break apart. Even though some of the planets could uh, remain close to commensurable orbits, but the resonance break apart. So we continue our iteration after the disk dissipates. And I'm showing you here the final planetary architectures uh, following one or other prescription. So in different color and sizes are the final planetary mass. And you can see in each of the simulations, uh, these architectures regarding the major axis of each planet. So as it was expected after the gas uh, phase, 
just in this simulation, in simulations under this prescription, a bunch of closing uh, planets survive uh, in, in all our simulations up to uh, one Earth masses. So they are uh, also inside the habitable zone. In here, I'm showing you the habitable zone uh, in pink at uh, one giga year and in the green color at uh, 100 million years. So the thing is, uh, it's, it's important, we didn't do this analysis in our work, but it's important to take into account the location of the planets with the evolution of the habitable zone for a further study. What we did, um, the latest was comparing just the planets that survive in close in orbits under this prescription. We compare them um, in this uh, cumulative distribution diagram regarding the bigger radius of adjacent planets, just the one located uh, closer than 0.1 AU. We compare them with the exoplanet population around um, stars less than 0 0.40, and then around stars less than 0 0.5. And we got the best agreement when we just compare them with the exoplanets around 0 0.14, which is a black solid line, and ours are, are the, um, the red solid uh, line, and just the shadows represent the poison uh, errors. So uh, we were quite happy to find that we are in agreement regarding the compact configuration of such planets. So just to take a point to take away, um, under this formation and evolutionary scenario, are just the simulations that include dynamical friction, uh, provide both uh, these, these three uh, statements, potential habitable planets that need to be carefully studied regarding the evolving habitable soil, inner planets close to commensurability, <laughs> and also they are found in compact orbits, which is in agreement with the exoplanet population around such low mass objects. So after that, our aim was to study uh, the detectability of such planets uh, around uh, very low mass stars. So to do that, we developed this uh, simulator. We are calling for now CEO, simulator for exoplanet observations. So this is a Python tool that what it's doing is uh, simulating time series of normalized stellar flux, prior velocity, and proper motion of a given sample of the stars. And just specifically due to the uh, interactions uh, with planetary systems, the code can also try to uh, uh, is a link with the library to remove um, stellar variability. And mm -hmm. also is uh, giving some uh, detection probabilities regarding each of the techniques. So in here, I'm just showing you um, a diagram for you to have an idea of how the code works. So you are giving to the code a sample of M stars that can be of the same mass or can be taken from the initial mass function. And then you're associating a lot of physical parameters and observational parameters to a star. And then you're taking a planetary architecture model that can be taken from the literature or to your own models. And then you're associating each planetary system to each star. And then uh, you are giving random orientation of the system with respect to the visual world. After that, you are, if you want to see the change in the light curve of the system, you are calling the exoplanet, which is called already um, public in the literature. And then you are, um, are obtaining this, uh, this time series of normalized flux. And then you are giving particular instrument or, or survey. And then you're associating uh, this, uh, this data with a given sampling and instrumental error. And then you can apply either the detection <laughs> method that you want, and you can obtain detection probability associated with transit. And also at the same time, there is another subroutine that you can call that is an interface with an, an embodied code. And with these simulations, you can obtain the changes in radio velocity and proper motion of this uh, planetary system. And then again, you're associating the time series with a given sampling and instrumental error with a, the instrument or survey that you want. And then use, using a particular detection method, again, you are estimating the detection probability. So for now, in this preliminary stage of the code, 
we will give the detection probability if we say that at least one planet in the system can be detected. And also we are using as a detection method these long scale periodograms because they are mostly designed to recover the frequencies when we have non-periodic assign uh, periodic assignments, but uh, not necessarily um, equally uh, spaced. And we will uh, give a tolerance to recover the orbital frequency uh, with a false alarm uh, probability of uh, bigger than 80%, and also um, with a, with a 90 percent of probability regarding the separation of the, of the peaks in the period. So we did our uh, first uh, test, trying to see, trying to estimate some detection probabilities of particular systems. Still, we didn't uh, do any statistics. So we took Travis one system and T Garden systems, and we ran the code for a sample of 100 stars analogous to these host stars. And then we just change randomly the inclination of the system regarding the the the, or in the, the line of the observer. And uh, we try to estimate if we change the, the instrumental error, how probably it is to detect such planets. So in here, I'm just showing you as an example, we did this test with a T garden system. So in here, you can see the radio velocity changes in time. The black dots are the estimated points uh, yeah. with our synthetic data. And then I overplot the um, T garden public data in red with the corresponding error bars. And here I'm showing you in these uh, periodograms how we can recover uh, the, the, the orbital frequency of the two planets as have been confirmed around T garden, both with the synthetic data and uh, with the public data that showing you how it was confirmed with more than a 95% probability in this case. Just for you to have an idea of quantifying these uh, radial velocity variations, if we have TRAPPIST-1-like systems, we, find, we can find, if we change the inclination of a star, uh, changing the radial velocity currently, just due to planetary systems uh, interactions between 10, uh, 3 and 10 meters per second, in the analogous of the TIGA and systems up to four meters per second. And we use, we did something analogous with uh, the planetary system architectures that we simulate. And we, uh, because the planets are located a bit farther from the star and they have lower masses, we obtain this um, a bit lower radial velocity variations. So we try to um, estimate this detection probability as I, as I mentioned before. So in here, I'm showing you how probably is to detect the system, even different instrumental errors. This is like the best sensitivity, for example, for, for congruence in the, um, in the MDORF domain. And I'm associating the instrumental error with the rotational period of the star. So I forget here to mention the paper in the literature where you can find this correlation this correlation, and then you can see in green uh, how the probability is increasing with instrumental error if we if we consider Travis one like system, in red if we consider the T-garden system, and in blue if we consider the simulated system. So even though we need kind of a really a small instrumental error to be able to detect to detect them, and also we need like a slower rotators. Is still quite promising given the amount of uh, very long stars that have been found so close into to our solar system and the good instrumental error that we have, for example, with a, a spectral flight harmonics. So we can already say that we will be able to detect in the future, hopefully, several Earth like plants around um, red stars. So this, I, I just show you in you, and it was mostly an amount of time, that we did something analogous with transit and also um, astrometry. And we couldn't find, I mean, the probability with detecting a planet like a system like this with transit is really low, less than 2%. And uh, with astrometry is still uh, impossible because we need uh, at least the last data release of the Gaia in order to reach such um, instrumental errors necessary to detect this kind of planet. So the most promising technique for now to detect such planetary system is going to be higher velocity.
but still a lot of work needs to be done. And I'm just hearing, uh, here I'm just going to summarize some ongoing work that I'm doing at uh, the university and mostly focusing on the plant formation around day long and start. So we are trying to study um, super earth formation around very long stars. We are trying to see which uh, are the most probably uh, formation scenarios in order to reach super earth configurations. So uh, we are just starting. So still uh, we have just raw preliminary results. This is why I didn't include here. But using the same embodied code with all the modifications that I mentioned before, I, I just include the variable equation in the scenario, following uh, these different prescriptions in the literature. And I can say for what I have seen now, that super Earth plant formation is possible in compact protoplanetary system when we are considering a low viscous disk. So it's quite promising that they can be formed under this uh, formation path. And uh, also regarding the detection probability of exoplanets with a simulator that I just shared with you. The idea is to expand uh, the code and then apply the code to do some statistics and, and mostly to do a statistics of uh, detection probability of exoplanets around Bailo mass stars as a whole sample and also try to include different detection methods, not just long scale periodograms, but maybe also. Um, the box list, box list uh, square periograms and do some analysis, recursive analysis of the signal in order to be able to give um, detection probabilities taking into account uh, several planets in the system. And both are ongoing works in preparation, but also the tools are um, quite flexible and can be applied to any kind of uh, low mass object. So the idea is then to expand not just the uh, study around by Lomon star, but also to the brown dwarf domain. So I guess I will leave it here and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magdalena, for this uh, talk. And um, as you say, <clears throat> please, uh, if anybody want to make a question in the room, raise your hand and uh, do it. Thanks, Mariana. Are there any questions for Mariana? Fran. Okay. Uh, thank you for, for this uh, very nice talk. Congratulations. Uh, I have thoughts on the questions that we can discuss later, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would like to know how impactful are your initial conditions in your simulations? Because if you go to the page 16, please, please define this correctly. You say that the embryos were located beyond the snow line. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Can you explain which is the motivation of that and how impactful is this in the final results? Yes. And the motivation was so when we had tried, we, um, we estimate the mass of the gas disk, we realized that uh, in the in orbits closer to the, um, I mean, inside the snow line, the available mass uh, regarding the, the uh, gas surface profile was so low. So it was like less than a, like a, one month. So then we say, okay, from the beginning, if we don't include migration, there's gonna be like a neglected mass. So then, okay, we are gonna put all our protoplanetary emus beyond that line. And also we believe this uh, particular initial location uh, is not gonna change the results because the migration is so fast. So if, even though if there was some protoplanetary embryos inside the snow line, they wouldn't have migrated so fast that most probably would have collided with the, with the star. This is why we put the on the snow line. Thank you for your answer. Um, mm -hmm. I have a question regarding the relation the distribution of resonance of your population plan. Yes. Why are you not taking into account the symptoms of the plan? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, we were trying to uh, find different orders of the resonance. So we found, we tried to find uh, first the first order resonance, and then we realized there were like different orders. Mm -hmm. So then we, we just make like a, 
in each system, we try to find okay, how many uh, resonance we have of different orders. And then we find, okay, we have like, in the cases where uh, many planets arrive inside, we have between uh, like four and seven planets. And then we say, okay, all of them are in resonance. And if they are in resonance, okay, in which order they are. But uh, we didn't do like a detailed analysis beyond that. So we say, okay, there are resonance change, there are, and they present different orders. But a detailed analysis of how these uh, restaurant configurations um, form or the relationship between the orders is, uh, we didn't go in detail. But it will be interesting too. Yeah, just because I, um, I had the idea that yeah, the thing is, I mean, we we saw that the resonance break apart and after the gas dis dissipate, but in the case where uh, in, in this last uh, simulations where include this prescription, we found that even though the resonance break apart, most of the planets remain so close to commensurabilities. So this analysis is just the first hundred million years. So it would be also interesting to see if we extend the simulations in a GIA time scale, if it's time enough for them to uh, come back to a, to a resonance is what we see today in most of the planetary systems. Yeah. Because we, we, we see today that there are systems that are found not only in commensurabilities, but in resonances. So yeah, I mean, we have to get there from your simulations to the, to the time we're observing these systems now to see what is happening. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as they remain close to commensurability, and they are not so far away from a resonance, but uh, it's not that uh, straightforward to see the, the critical angle debate. But I believe if we extend the simulations in a year, a year time scale, maybe we will be able to see how they are recovering the resonance. Yeah, that seems to be done. You were showing the kind of sensitivity for topics, for example, from the Greek garden as well. Uh, you explained that it's, I mean, that I, I missed that. What have you changed to, did you say that you changed the inclination of the star to get the first table? Yes. The inclination of the star. The inclination of the star in, I mean, we took a hundred, a sample of a hundred stars, mm -hmm. and uh, for each of them, we changed the inclination with respect to the sky plane. Mm -hmm. And then we did, we repeat this uh, simulation of 100 stars for different instrumental years. But the, the, the main parameter that changed with the, was the inclination of the star. I mean, we change, we know for sure, at least with a really good precision, masses, rays of the planet and the stars, the major axis and eccentricity. But we also give uh, the rest of the orbital elements necessary to make these calculations. We also um, give aleatory numbers to them. But the parameter that has the most uh, yeah. the higher effect is the inclination. Uh, we go with Ivan first. Then My thanks for the talk. Mm -hmm. I have a very normal question. Like, uh, you started your simulations with the whole plan of plants. Mm -hmm. Did you see in the short time scale change in the inclination of plants, or it's still like in that short time scale, it's still like a plant? Yeah, I mean, we, we analyzed if the um, inclination of the planet was uh, as excited as the eccentricity, but it didn't, it didn't happen. I mean, what, what the, this model that we use uh, with this low viscosity is uh, leaving the planets always close to a coplanarity. So the eccentricity can go up to maybe 0 0.1, uh, but the inclination is going to be always less than the haze scale of the disk. This is why we could also use that, that prescription. Right, so uh, automatically when you when you do the long survival, like you assume that it's like how's it going to be this thing like the detection, mm -hmm. right? the detection, so you just yeah. add with this one. Yes, exactly. And the, these um, inclinations that you are talking is um, are like the mutual inclination between the plants that are really low close to see. Uh, 
the, the ones that are um, close to zero are the inclination of the planet regarding like the midplane of, of the system. But the inclination that uh, was the parameter that changed was the inclination of the system as a whole regarding the line of the observer. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, mm -hmm. Right. <coughs> According to this plot, uh, it should be very easy to find this kind of system starting one or two atoms, right? Yeah. But there is a discrepancy with observation because we are not finding this kind of system. I mean, they are very special systems, but yes. we only find one. So <laughs> yeah. there is a no. I know how, how to explain this. I know. <laughs> the thing is, we. I mean, this is you can uh, think as uh, like upper limit. So in, in because this detection probability are just based on the fact that at least one planet in the system can be detected. So now the seven planets in the system as a whole. So uh, when we analyze the time series and then we did the uh, periodograms, we say, okay, at least one of the planets is beyond this 90% um, of Pazaran probability. Okay, then we are gonna put that that system can be detected. But this doesn't mean that we can detect a um, travel system with seven uh, signs. So we believe that when we include this recursive analysis of the sign, this probability is, is gonna decrease. Okay, yes, I understood the, the point that I can understand the point of the seven plans from one plans of the garden, but uh, but the probably one is a very less massive star where we mm -hmm. have constant planets mm -hmm. and uh, and nothing else. I mean the, the next the next star with planets is the garden and then mm -hmm. the most of them are mid and dwarf. Yes. So for very late and dwarf, we are not finding planets. Mm -hmm. Even from brown dwarf actually at the beginning you show. Uh, that there are 18 planets uh, uh, orbiting in brown dwarf, but I'm not sure about this definition because uh, I think that they are not in uh, orbiting brown dwarf. So I don't exactly the limit that you use to define. I, I in that sample I took brown dwarf uh, between 0 0.013 and up to 0 0.06, and most of the companions. I mean, there are a few exceptions like uh, super Earth mini neutrons, but most of them are giant planets. Maybe they are just binary. Systems um, of a uh, kind of uh, low mass brown dwarf and, and a bigger uh, brown dwarf. Yeah, I'd say that all of them are from this kind of objects. Uh, yeah, just a few of them represent maybe a super earth that are just few <laughs> exceptions close to 0 0.06. What I have Check seen here. Yeah. So the, uh, this, this one in here, there are just a uh, these few examples. The rest are also close to uh, being a giant planet, or even some. If you take into account the error, maybe uh, they are close to the um, uh, substellar low mass limit. So they are not exoplanets. I mean, the same confirmed exoplanets. Yes, because in the in the NASA exoplanet archive, they are they, they are the as confirmed exoplanets, but most of them uh, I included just because they were in the in the archive. But most of them, they are uh, ambiguous because the uh, estimation of the mass is so close to the lower uh, substellar mass limit. So uh, they are not completely uh, explained. They are so close to the limit of being frontal. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you for this very interesting talk. Mm -hmm. Then we made a short advertising because some years ago we discovered a very compact of the time time mm -hmm. only three remaining mm -hmm. rating in the at the end of the start. I know Nikki Van der Marken is looking for more yes. spaces. Uh, we suggest in that time that this could be the present talk or mm -hmm. perhaps the uh, close link or <coughs> the comparative system. The so called cross new packet, nine traffic. Mm -hmm. No, I would like to suggest you that has to be over the initial condition mm -hmm. so we can compare the density which is present to the species, yes. the temperature, even the viscosity that has to go mm -hmm. into the model. Yeah, yeah, that would be that would be really nice. I mean, the idea of uh, trying of um, the actual research that we are doing. Is trying to link the 
characteristic of protoplanetary planetary disk with uh, exactly which kind of planetary architectures are we using. So trying to make this uh, input more more realistic and in comparison with protoplanetary planetary disk, that's what we've done. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Say that there are no mini Neptunes or super Earths found around very low mass stars, considering these are uh, spectral types seven and below, uh, and, and no planets detected at all. Like what well, the government wants. What you like to do? Uh, maybe this is, a, I'm not sure, but from your simulation, which is the larger size of the, larger, the more massive planet that you cannot take. Close to one Earth mass. Okay. Uh, uh, between one ma one Mars and one Earth. So this yeah. is actually the yeah. yeah. These are the 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 thick gardens. Yeah. The trappies. Uh, yeah. This is and the, because they are very low rotation, very slow rotation, they can't be discovered because of this reason they are bright. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I mean also this uh, high, well, the highest probability is like more really slow mm -hmm. rotators and it's needed like really. Really high sensitivity to you know, so we saw maybe that's what they want. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. In your models, your embryos, do they are colliding? Mm -hmm. uh, are you supposing that they are perfect measures yes, or exactly. they are losing some mass? No, just perfect measures. Yeah, okay. but it will be because the, the original version of Mercury code just consider like collision uh, perfectly elastic ones. But it is also in the plans to try to use one collisional model to see if we also include fragmentation or hit and run, if uh, how the upper limits of the planetary mass change. Yes. Do you think that we need, we need a large difference when we include this in the model? As a preliminary studies, uh, try to, to do this one with a bit more massive stars. And they are still finding that. The most probably kind of collision are perfect merge. So at around 80% of the collisions are perfect merge. So in principle, we don't believe it's gonna change much. Maybe just gonna refine a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah final mass. <clears throat> we have questions here in the room. Because if we don't. There is a question on Zoom. Can I do it? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, Marena, Miguel yeah. Perez Torres uh, in the chat, he is asking the initial density in the embryos of five grams per cubic centimeters is very close to the current earth density. Mm -hmm. How well do we know that initial density? Wouldn't it be better to provide a range of densities? Yes. <laughs> but the thing, uh, we, we just took, um, I mean, the idea, the ideal scenario will be to explore different uh, initial conditions, but we didn't do that mostly because of uh, expensive computational time. Because each of these simulations took around two, three months to run. So we didn't, uh, we couldn't explore very much because mostly of time. So we just um, use like the similar density of the Earth and also to study the, um, the tidal interactions. We use uh, Earth-like parameters for all these plants. Um, but as the density is not one of the, um, uh, the main parameters, it's gonna make some relevant changes in the 
tidal interactions or the gas disk as a, a first um, thought. I, I wouldn't expect this gonna change significantly the results, but um, yeah, it will be good if we could explore a, a wider range. But I, I, because now we are, we consider that all the protoplanetary embryos were already formed. So I guess a bigger impact is um, taking into account like previous formation stages. So taking into account, for example, paper accretion or planetesimal accretion. I guess this one will lead to more different results that it would change, uh, for example, the, the density of, of the location of the initial protoplanetary embryo. So I guess it would be worth it to try that first and then try to, to play with the, this input as, as the density, I believe. Okay, uh, yeah. no more questions in the chat, I guess? Or I, have a, I have a question also. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, in, in our solar system, the, there were problems to fit the distribution of masses of our rocky planets. And the solution came with the Grand TAC uh, model, which is the interaction of uh, Jupiter in the first uh, million years, uh, a, a, a migration to, to the star and then coming back. And this is the solution for uh, the uh, mass of Mars, for example. So can you put in the model uh, interactions with the uh, other massive planets with migration inside to the to the closer to the stars to <clears throat> see the distribution of the rocky planets very close to to, to your star mm -hmm. yes so uh, we started with just uh, analyzing the formation of rocky planets mostly because of what we find in protoplanetary disk like the disk are so compact and low mass and also regarding the explant population, we are expected that uh, low mass planets are the most common one to be expected around this kind of low mass objects. So this is why we mainly focus on, on considering just low mass planets in this kind of uh, scenarios. But um, I hope I can show, show you uh, later on this year, next year, that how if you include paper accretion, you can find these uh, compact planetary systems without the necessity of including a giant planet. But in the cases of, there are some examples of more massive disk that uh, could host a giant planet. And this is also can be doable, so we just need to include um, type two migration in the code. And in, in that case, we could evaluate a, a formation scenario in where also a giant planet is um, involved. Yeah, that will be interesting to see. But here in, in the coder systems like M dwarf and, and brown dwarf, mm -hmm. uh, all the systems are is like into scale. It's in a lower scale. So maybe you it's not necessary to have a giant planet, but also mm -hmm. to have a super Earth yes. planet. But uh, to form a super Earth planet really early on the on the system is difficult. So okay. I mean, if, if you include uh, an efficient civil accretion model, it seems under particular conditions is to aim. Okay. But we, we can go on that later on, and I can show you more uh, detailed results. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah. Okay, no more questions there, Rene, in the chat? No more question on the chat. No questions. No here. more question on, on the YouTube, no. Okay, so we thank Maida again for her talk. Okay. We will be going for lunch now. So you are welcome to reach